welcome back to Questions, Answers, and Solutions. Of course, I'm your host, Jameer Hayward. Um, I want to give a shout out to the engineer in the house tonight from FLO Empire Radio. Um, I also want to give um, a shout out to my number one supporter, Todd Taylor, who's always in the house. And I want to say thank you so much also to the engineer for that background music that is just wonderful. Um, so without further ado, um, thank you to the viewers and supporters who are tuning in tonight. Uh, tonight's conversation is all about incarceration and reentry into the, into the community. Um, this is definitely a conversation that we should have, uh, and I'm hoping that this is not the last time we are discussing this matter. So without further ado, I want to introduce Javier, and I'm going to let him pronounce his last name because it's French, right? Yes. Okay, so what's your last <laughs> name, Javier? My name is Javier Durecou, but it's Duracut. Duracut. <laughs> du, Dureku. 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 That's the way it's really pronounced, okay. but I'm used to Duracut. <laughs> All right. All right, Javier. So can I call you Javier? Javier is perfect. All right. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So let's jump right into this conversation because there's a lot that we need to talk about tonight. And I was talking to you a little bit before yes. the show. And I'm so interested in your experience and all that you have to say. And I just first and foremost want to say thank you so much for sharing this intimate personal story with us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm sure that it's going to impact millions okay um okay javier so what is your history with incarceration okay do you want me to start from the very beginning in 1998 sure okay well definitely. bring us into it we need to know the story right. to understand that's right okay. well the, the, my very that was really one of my very first experiences i ever being incarcerated in my life you know mm -hmm. that was a promise that i gave my grandmother that i kept that she would never see me you know behind any bars because she, she had experienced that with her own son and I told her that she would never have to experience that with me. Right. Well, my grandmother had passed away uh, a couple of years before and, you know, my family was going a little bit haywire. You know, she wasn't around so the nest wasn't together, you know, so I started getting out of hand. Mm -hmm. You know, I started to drink a lot, you know, and things that I shouldn't be doing and I done them. And then I ran into uh, a sour relationship and the result of that sour relationship is that it cost me uh, 16 and a half years of my life. Mm. You know, um, so when you say sour relationship, talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about that. When I say sour relationship, it means a relationship that was uh, uh, not only my grandmother was against, but my aunt was against it, uh, my cousins were against it. You know, it was a relationship that really didn't, it really wasn't headed anywhere, but I tried to hold it together only because of the simple fact that I was raising a little girl that I didn't have children of my own that I fell in love with. Right. You know, uh, I was, you know, it was I was lied to. You know, mm -hmm. they told me that that um, the baby's father was, you know, that he had passed away mm -hmm. and he had didn't pass away. Uh, he showed up maybe six or seven years later. Mm -hmm. After I, you had already yeah. um, invested time yeah. and energy Ra into this young child. girl that wasn't yours. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, we happened, she happened to have called me, and then uh, me and him had bumped heads. And when we bumped heads, being that I didn't know that was the baby's father, you know, one thing led to another, and I ended up going to jail for second-degree murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I yeah. just had to digest that. I'm yes. sorry. And mm -hmm. I know that's the second time you told me, but, you mm -hmm. know, it it, it it took away my breath. So I could imagine how you felt that day in court when you yes. were sentenced. To, uh, yes. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well... Uh, once I found out it was the baby's father, you know, I, you know, I had to make sure that I, you know, apologize to the family because of the simple fact that I just didn't know that that was the, the little girl that I had raised father mm -hmm. uh, that I had fell in love with. So wait a minute, you felt remorseful? Very about, remorseful. Okay. Very remorseful. Remorseful to the point that I had actually uh, went back and forth with my lawyer and everything saying, listen, I don't want to take this to trial. I just want to be afforded an opportunity to apologize to the family. Mm -hmm. I was afforded that opportunity on uh, February 13th when I was sentenced. And on uh, February 13th... And this was of 19... Uh, that was in 1999. Mm -hmm. I got arrested in 1998. I was on Rikers Island for a year. And in 1999, February 13th, I was afforded that opportunity to apologize to the Felicianos. Mm -hmm. And uh, in walking inside that courtroom was one of the biggest nightmares that I think that I've ever encountered in my life. For the simple fact that when I walked into the courts, all I seen was his family. My family looked so small. It looked like a, oh my God, it, 
it's almost like a little speck considering that the whole courtroom was his family right kids uh, brothers sisters brother i mean uncles uh, father mother you know and then um when I turned, I actually turned towards them and I, I had wrote something out because I didn't know if I was going to forget anything. So I wanted to make sure I didn't leave anything out. So I apologized to the family, but it assisted me mm -hmm. in that apology because uh, when I went back inside, when they took me in, that I knew that I had to start spending my time. It relieved me mm -hmm. because of the simple fact that I was I was able to at least make try try to attempt to make amends with the family right. that I'm not this type I was not raised this way mm -hmm. you know I was born <laughs> I mean I was I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth you know I was the only grandson around I was you know everybody loved me you know I've never been I don't even know what hate is you mm -hmm. know I did, you know I, the meaning of hate never came from my family right. so by that by you know by being afforded that opportunity to apologize, what it did was prepare me for the world that I was about to, to, to about to get into. Right, which was a different world than was the world that we lived very in different world. in the community. Yes, very different world. Okay. However, I prepared, it was it mentally prepared me. Mm -hmm. It mentally prepared me because I accepted it, and it also helped me in trying to explain. It, excuse me, to mm -hmm. my family, and I say that because if I would have blew trial. And they would have gave me 25, then my family would have took it harder mm -hmm. because they would have said, you know, that boy ain't never did no time in prison. And now he just blew the 25 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it would have hit them harder because my, my aunt got this skinny. So within a couple of months. Right. And that was due to excessive stress. Yes. Based around the situation ba exactly. and everything like that. And how yes. uh, <clears throat> you were frequently going back and forth to court before you were sentenced. How long did it take for you to be sentenced? It took exactly a year. Exactly a year. I got arrested in 98, and in uh, February 13, 1999, I was sentenced. Okay. Um, that same month, I was upstate. All right. Were you incarcerated throughout the, yes, the process? Yes, I was. Okay, so Absolutely. you were incarcerated locally maybe on Rikers Island? I was uh, from the Brooklyn House to Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. uh, I was moved around to um, a queen, to the Queen's House, uh, mm -hmm. Manhattan, the Tombs. I was, basically, my lawyer had me going all over the place to meet him. So, you know, I experienced all of those local... Right, so he had to put produced in different counties so exactly. that you guys can have council visits exactly. and things of that nature. Yes, okay, and which was the worst. Brilliant. And what was that... Let's just go back a little bit. What was that mm -hmm. waiting experience like for you, um, knowing that, mm -hmm. you know, and you willfully just, you know, you admitted that you did something that, mm -hmm. of course, you weren't, you know, those weren't part of your morals and values. You were very mm -hmm. apologetic. What yeah. was that waiting period like, knowing that you would be sentenced to um, 16 or more years in prison? In the very beginning, it it was, uh, whew, it was, I, I don't think there's words that I can put together. <laughs> to try to even explain, you know, uh, the traumatic experience that I was going through. And just, you know, thinking about that, I had to do this type of time in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing, I was offered 50 years. I was not offered 25, I was offered 50. Right. Uh, however, you know, I was able to talk them down to 17. Okay. And it's only because of the simple fact that I didn't allow it to go I didn't allow my lawyer to go try to fight it in any type of way because right. I told him, look, I don't want to take this to trial. I, I insisted that you give me, I just want to be afforded that opportunity to apologize to the family. Okay. So he he was the one that was telling me, let's just wait, calm down, mm -hmm. you know, let's see what we can do. Mm -hmm. You know, don't don't rush to anything. Mm -hmm. And but was this um, a private attorney or public defender? It was a private attorney. Okay. It was a private attorney. Okay. However, you know, because I had already made that final decision, mm -hmm. uh, I already knew that I was looking at that time. I was trying to bring it down to 15 years, but they didn't want to give me the 15 years due to the seriousness of the crime that was committed. Yes. You know, in another state, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good possibility they kind of gave me the, the injection, you know, because <laughs> that's just the way it is. Thank God I was in New York, you know, second degree murder, second degree murder, you know, first degree murder is a cop or any one of them officials. Mm -hmm. Second degree murder is um, they uh, uh, indicted me with depraving difference for human life. Right. You know, they couldn't uh, indict me for uh, murder with intent because they couldn't prove that I actually knew the person. Right. So both of them carry the same sentence. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, however, that's what they indicted me with. Okay. And because of the seriousness of the crime, I knew that I was not going to get less than 15 years. Okay. So, um, so 
-hmm. throughout your waiting process, you were kind of prepared for the sentence that you received. Yes. Okay. And not only being prepared for the sentence that I was receiving, but preparing my family that that was the sentence that I was going That's to That's important receive. because a lot of times, you yes. know, I, I work with um, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, clients mm -hmm. who have a history of incarceration. Yes. And one of the most difficult parts is not only is this person going away, mm -hmm. that's been an integral part of your life, exactly. um, but the family also has to deal with another mm -hmm. side of issues. You know, they have their yes. own stressors and things of that and the support, which we're going to get into a little later. Got you. So once you, you know, where was where were you housed for the 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 16 and a half years or did you go to different places okay i was housed for i was housed in the sing sing correctional facility for over 10 years okay a little bit over 10 years mm -hmm. and i'm gonna tell you the truth that uh like i always say that god always have a plan uh sing sing correctional facility i call it the university of sing sing mm -hmm. because this is where i found uh Hudson Link. I found higher education for the incarcerated. Okay. So the way to not only set yourself and in, in choosing the right, making the right decisions in prison to make it back home to your family mm -hmm. is that certain programs that are set up and you being involved with them mm -hmm. sort of assist you in your mindset in the direction that you want to go. Mm -hmm. All right. I, um, once I became a part of that college program, mm -hmm. then in 2010, I got an associate's degree in uh, behavior science. Mm -hmm. uh, so wait, let's go back a little bit, right? So <laughs> what, I, I know we were talking a little Good. bit earlier about mm -hmm. your grandmother and yes. what actually set you on this path to think, look, I know that I'm facing this amount of years. Mm -hmm. I have to get my head on straight. These yes. are the things that I want to do. So what led you towards that positive path while you were incarcerated? Uh, because... Like I had told you that I didn't realize, even though I may have committed, you know, I may have made that choice that I should have made, mm -hmm. you know, that took me away from loved ones that I love dearly. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how much love that I had, aside from the love that my grandmother had for me. Right. When I looked, you know, when I seen the visits and the, the letters and I started to realize, you know, that I had so many other people in my family that loved me, mm -hmm. you know, m just as much as my grandmother did. And that's what told me, look, my goal here now is to make it back home. Mm. You know, my world was never going to be this world. My world will never be the world of incarceration. Mm. I am not used to this. Now I will adapt. I am a chameleon. Mm -hmm. I will adapt. Mm -hmm. But I am not a part of this, though. And I would change colors when I get out of here. So and physically, you were incarcerated, yes. but mentally, mentally, you were I focused on your goals and a, right. achieving higher achievement. Exactly. And okay, mm -hmm. so now bring us back into the program. Okay, so then I went into this program and I met Warren Buffett. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a lot of other guys that was just as studious as I was and wanted to get their education and they wanted to graduate, and we all graduated. Uh, Cuomo comes into office and he made some changes. He came to visit Sing Sing. And when he visited Sing Sing, he made a speech and he said that he was no longer going to continue to house uh, human beings in order to create jobs. Mm. You know, he's going to actually start shutting these places down and we're going to start investing the money in programs to see how we can help and assist these these uh, these men and trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, readapt or reintegrate into society again. Right. So, so let's ahead. talk a, a little mm -hmm. bit about the history of, mm -hmm. excuse me. Inmates, if I may. Yes. Okay. Inmates right. and mm -hmm. when they're housed, some of their duties, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. facility duties. Okay. What was that about? Oh, Lord. Because I know <laughs> Cuomo was trying to sway away from that yes. and, and bring in mm -hmm. a new development and focus more on education, things yes, of that nature. So what was that like? Do you think it was? Mm -hmm. I think one of the major mistakes the that they did, like, uh, I'm going to say this was the Pataki era, mm -hmm. is that they actually removed um, the college programs from prison. You know, I like, like, you gotta. This is the way I look at it. Look, one day they're gonna be your next door neighbor. Would you want an educated guy next to you that did twenty something years, or you would like the guy that didn't have no education whatsoever move next to you and, mm -hmm. and then get released from prison? Mm -hmm. You know, I think I would prefer the educated person because mm -hmm. the educated person, hopefully, the education has um, affected him in sort of a way to try to make him think a little bit differently. That you don't have to worry about your your shed being robbed or. 
Absolutely. Or your, or your, or your kids being killed, or anything, anything of that nature. You know, in mm-hmm. fact, it puts him in a better position in life that he starts loving freedom that he doesn't want to go back to jail. So mm-hmm. he starts thinking differently. Right. Basically. Because I've I've heard mm-hmm. yeah. some people who've been incarcerated say that jail is their second home, and recidivism mm-hmm. is big. They, yeah. you know, because they're so used to it and they don't know how to adapt to society, yes. they constantly go back and forth into prison because. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. like home to them. Yes. All right. And I know mentally mm-hmm. it wasn't home for you, but physically you had no other choice but to adapt. As exactly. you said, you're a chameleon. Yes. All right. So yes. um, talk to us a little bit about the educational component. All right. The educational component is that first thing I graduated magna cum laude. Mm. So uh, not only that, I learned, uh, I learned how to read and write Arabic, you know, so uh, by learning how to read and write Arabic, it taught me a different language. So it, it was my means of escape from the prison. Okay. All right. So they say, so did I allow for the prison system to incarcerate my mind? No, I was free. Okay. I was so I was free in my social in my books of sociology. I was free in my books of psychology. I was free in all. I was I, I was even free with Socrates that I was reading, mm-hmm. because the simple fact that I had so much interest in all of that educational. Uh, information that I really didn't think about being in prison. Got it. So, and one of the major things that really, that some of the guys used to say, yo, you coming outside to the yard, man? I go, nah, nah, I'm good. And I used to put my curtain up just where I could read and type. Mm. And, And I would do this three, four days in a row. And I would go exercise, of course, you know, the weekends or go in the morning and, you know, to make sure I could keep my, my body fit. Mm-hmm. But the reality is that my means of escape was education. Right. That was my means of escape. That was my means of escape, not only from the prison system, but to focus on getting back home to my family. Mm. Because I said, well, maybe they're not releasing you now because of education, because there was a time that they wouldn't release you. Listen, I, I'm in jail for second degree murder. You know, you know, chances are that they're going to release you on the first board. It's mm-hmm. not really a, right. Slim to none. That's slim to none. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, exactly. It's slim to none. Mm-hmm. However, you know, something told me to continue doing it. So I have to say that this was like a, a divine inspiration from my Lord mm-hmm. that just continually to inc- you know encourage me to don't give up, mm-hmm. and I wouldn't give up. So I turned around and I, I got my like I, I got my associate's degree in 2010, mm-hmm. but then I seen that that the prison system was changing and your associate's degree was in what field and behavior science behavior science yeah okay and then uh i started to notice that the environment of the population of the prison system began to change in what aspects and i'm gonna say like this uh a lot of men are not built like the men that we grew up with what Uh, do you mean me and todd Mm -hmm. is it physically mentally mentally okay Mentally, and, and I'm gonna give you an example. Mm-hmm. When I first entered in 1999 into Sing Sing Correctional Facility, um, the the medication line, and when I say the med line, I'm talking psych, psych meds, mm-hmm. wasn't as long as it was in 2010. Wow. In 2010, the med line looks like a yard run, mm-hmm. meaning all of the young kids were going into jail at the age of 18, and they were running to the meds to escape by using some of the medication that they use in order to uh, keep them, uh, what they call it, uh, let me see what the word I could use Is for this Is it alert word. or to go to sleep? No, it's not alert. It's to like, uh, oh man, that's a perfect word. So that's what it is. But anyway, but what it did was, it, what it did was keep them sedated. Okay. It keep them sedated. High. Okay. High. All right. So they were sedated. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, I'm here, but I'm not here because they're under the influence of these 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 medications. So, would you say that, from a certain perspective, they were drug seeking? They were basically replacing the 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 addiction that they had in the street mm-hmm. with the medication legally that they were giving them in prison. So, some of these some of these younger kids that were coming in and doing hard time, they had a, had a history of substance abuse, and then they a were lot using- of them had a history of uh, substance abuse. Wow. And then they will replace it with the meds. Got it. They will replace it. And then where it hurts because these guys wasn't coming in with one year, two years. Mm-hmm. These guys were coming in with 50 years, 75 years. We're talking about 18 year old kids with 75 years. So, you know, you tell a kid that's 75 years, you know, you're going to have to have a strong mind to be able to get, get around that and try to fight your way out of it because you're going to have to hit that law library. That's right. You're going to have to hit that law library. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was different when uh, in my era when when I came in because when I came in that's all they did was show us about the law library. Mm-hmm. You know, I became a paralegal in there. Mm-hmm. 
So the reality is, is that, you know, it's all about finding a way, a loophole of some sort to try to get out of this place. Not, right. You know what I'm saying? Now the law libraries are empty. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, when I left, I don't know about now, I haven't been in prison for the past four years, but when mm-hmm. I left, they were empty. Right. The only guys that were in there were guys like me, the old timers, guys that have been fighting their cases since they got there. Mm-hmm. And I know um, mm-hmm. we were talking before the show mm-hmm. about the community that you kind of built while you mm-hmm. were incarcerated yes. and the family structure and mm-hmm. the leading yes. mentality that you had in prison. Talk mm-hmm. to us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, I became the naive um, under a good brother and mm-hmm. uh in the a outside court. A naive is. A naive is a. It, it's called a deputy. Deputy. A deputy. He's a deputy under the imam. Mm-hmm. All right. Meaning the leader of the Muslim community. Okay. All right. He's the deputy. Mm-hmm. Meaning when he's not around, the deputy takes over. Okay. Right? All right. Me. Yeah. You don't have to. You <laughs> got to explain. Yeah, you got to no, break no, it down. No, you know. Okay, I need to know the that's, sciences. That's, <laughs> that's basically it. Yeah. That's okay. basically it. Okay. So, and. Uh, we had at least 125 brothers. Mm-hmm. You know, there were many more, and there were probably two in change, but there was only 125 consistent brothers that we dealt with. Okay. All right. Uh, however, you know, our mindset was a lot different than uh, a lot of the other people who were leading those other organizations. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we are a righteous group. Yes, we did pray five times a day. We did learn about how to forgive, but we also had a different type of structure in defending each other. Mm-hmm. And because of us and our unity and what we believed in, we became strong. And when I say we became strong, we became strong in the sense not only physically, in mm-hmm. the sense that we were respected because of our unity. However, we became strong mentally because then you had guys like uh, my leader, uh, my leader, and me being the, the the naive was able to motivate the youth into educating themselves and doing the positive things and trying to make it back home to your family man Mm -hmm. and that should be your focus man right did you ever but did you ever have to did you ever feel like you were in a compromising situation where you had to defend yourself before you became muslim or before you became a naive there's always a time for (laughs) defending yourself well that's the world that 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 is the incarcerated world yeah incarcerated world they only understand one language and, and on, what's that language? I mean, that, that's the language of physical, you know, and yeah. um, the physical language, the, the language of, of, you know, either you're going to respect me or I'm going to make you respect me, either one. So there's two different, it yeah. was two different worlds. There's two different worlds. Such as, you know, when we get mm-hmm. to, when we talk about the reentry stage and when we talk about being incarcerated and being exactly. housed and things like that. And, exactly. Um, your safety. Did you fear for your safety at some point? All the time. Mm. all the time I, and I guess that's what got me spiritually close to my higher power mm-hmm. because when I felt that I couldn't control it then I would have to just bend I would have to postulate and ask my Lord to help me out mm-hmm. one of the things that I used to call my Lord I used to say Allahu waliyu ladina amanu which means God is a protecting friend of those who believe and that carried me straight faith. through prison like faith having faith that's right okay. that carried me straight through prison no matter what drama that was mm-hmm. you know that i knew that we were going to encounter mm-hmm. whether it was going to be with blood organizations or the latin kings or the rat hunters or because these are the organizations in prison you know, right and were you able to mm-hmm. at some point come together with those different organizations well um, and some people refer to those organizations yes. as gangs but were you able to mm-hmm. come together were some of them a part Definitely. of the Muslim um, community and definitely okay and how how easy mm-hmm. was it for you to get them to be a part of the community well what happens is is that uh, n- nobody really likes being in prison okay and because and if you do then you have an issue but if you don't then it's easier to reach out to you mm-hmm. and you know we have to f- we have to find some way of peace you know and trying to you know, and trying to communicate to other organizations along with your own organization that this is not the way we should be living. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to live a different type of way, meaning, I'm, you know, I I miss my family, you know, and I used to emphasize that all the time. I miss being with my family. Mm -hmm. Your family here? Yeah, my family at home. Okay. Okay. My home. All right. So this was, this is what you were saying when you were incarcerated. Yeah. Okay. I miss my family. Okay. And if you don't miss yours, do you have any? You, yeah, I miss my family. Well, you miss your family too. So we got something in common, right? We got something in common. We both miss our families, right? Mm-hmm. So is it going to pay that, you know, that you turn around and you 
put an ice pick in my neck and kill me and I have to do an extra 25 years in prison not making it home back to your family does it pay right. I mean is it really worth it mm-hmm. you know because I, I look at it and I say to myself I, it's not really worth it you know n- not to lose everything mm-hmm. you know come on you you don't have anything else to prove man you already in prison for second degree murder okay. you're already in prison for taking someone else's life what do you got to prove in here mm-hmm I mean, all you're doing is you're already incarcerated. You know, there's no other place other than incarceration but the box. That's right. That's it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. We have a caller <laughs> yeah. on the line. Gotcha. So let's welcome the caller. Hi, caller. Who am I speaking with? Serrano. <laughs> hey, Serrano. Wow. How you doing? <laughs> cousin. This is your cousin, That's my right? cousin. That's yes, my cousin. Yes, yes. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just listening in, and uh, I thought I'd call in. <laughs> Absolutely. You want and, you have uh, you want to uh, make a statement or join a conversation? You have some things to say? Yeah, I just want to share. Uh, I just want to share something uh, with you guys that that so uh, that so everyone can hear and know that my cousin he um, he's one of the most outstanding people on this earth. You know he. Um, he went through a whole lot, and uh, and he prevailed, and he prevailed to an extent of, you know, like his accomplishments are just like incredible, and like I, I couldn't be more proud of him, you know, as as his uh, as his brother. He's my cousin, but he, me and him are like brothers, and uh, I remember, uh, you know, when he went in, and. Um, it was a it was a big you know upsetting thing for the whole family, but it changed him for the better. And mm-hmm. uh, he came home and he's he's an outstanding person, an outstanding young man. He did very well, and I'm very proud of him. That's that's what I wanted to share. Oh, that that was <laughs> heartfelt. You almost had me in tears over here, Serrano. Mm-hmm. And 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 um. Just to speak a little bit about our conversation, um, Javier was mentioning that that was his main focus, you know, while he was incarcerated. Everything was, you know, geared around him being um, obviously a a positive role model, you know, keeping his head on straight and getting home to his family while he was incarcerated. So you would definitely and your other families would family members were definitely on his mind while he was incarcerated. I'm sure he shared that with you so many times uh, since he's been home. Yes. Yeah, we, um, you know, we went through so much when he went in, and it was like, you know, it was like, it was so surreal. We really didn't understand, like, how mm. this could have happened. And, um, you know, people go through things in life, we realized, because when it first happened, it was like, you know, I'll never forget, you know. I was like, wow, you know. And then as the years went by, I was like, wow, we really lost our cousin, you know. Yeah. We lost just like, losing the family member, literally, like, right there in front of your eyes and wow. and when um when i've seen his progress throughout the years as we went and visited him and his attitude the way it changed and his, his you know his uh, the way his mind opened up to better himself mm-hmm. it, was, it was just very uh it was it was very like outstanding it was like something that was like to be admired you know for someone facing what he faced he, he went through the, the torment, he went through the rain, and he went through the storm, and he just kept positive all those years. And then when he came home, he stayed on that path. And like he was saying, the programs that he involved himself in were the programs that benefited him. And him just keeping that positive attitude and staying on track was really, you know, I really got to commend him for that because it, it put him in a good position in life right now. and. And everyone that surrounded him, that he surrounds himself with, only seek positive change and betterment for him. And he's he's been a, a good example of, of of someone that went through the worst and has come out on top. And I'm very very proud of him. All of our family is very proud of him. And uh, Hobbs, we love you. We're glad for all your accomplishments. And uh, keep doing the best work that you're doing. Keep up the good work, brother. Thank you, baby. Wow. I love you, baby. Those words were impactful mm-hmm. and inspiring. And I mm-hmm. thank you so, so much, Serrano, for calling in and sharing right. those kind words with us. You know, I called in before. I know. Um, when I see my cousin up there, I just say, you know, I have to call in and just 
give him, commend him for his accomplishments. And um, I love you, cuz. Mm-hmm. And keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you, Serena. Thank you for the uh, support. Uh, all right, no problem. All <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to turn um, Mm -hmm. to um, Facebook really quickly. Um, Mm -hmm. Michelle, shout out to Michelle Troy Paris. She made a comment. She says, wow, so uh, Cuomo admitted to using inmates to create jobs. So that's something that we touched on briefly. Mm -hmm. Um, Shout out to Dolores uh, Moody, who tuned in. Um, Michelle also said these guys like this are the real deal um, and not these athletes and actors. You can come out on the other side of that and you're made of something. So shout out to Michelle for your comments. Shout out to Rich uh, Watkins who tuned in, uh, Minister Larry Walker, Will Wise. Um, I think this says Doris G. Watts or Dorsey, Dorsey G. Watts. So shout out to everybody who's tuning in and uh, supporting us from social media, Facebook. So let's talk a little bit about being in the box, because I know I've heard so many different stories about, you know, Mm -hmm. how, you know, how do you keep your mind Mm -hmm. from going crazy and the little figurines that you may see, Mm -hmm. which are actually some people Mm -hmm. say maggots and all types of things and moving creatures and making friends Mm -hmm. and things of that nature and Mm -hmm. reading and just being Mm -hmm. in that. Is it a dark space? Yeah, let me tell you the truth because I, I want to, you know, start clear something up. Okay. Um, first thing, uh, I, I was always a very isolated person, so I always like being by myself all the time. I'm still having a problem with that now. Okay. I'm breaking out of it slowly, but um, box time that I have done it was never because I went and did something else worse in prison that had, that caused me to go to the box because mm-hmm. that never was the case. Absolutely. However, you know. I was under investigation, mm-hmm. and those type of investigations took me away from population. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, I I am here and proud to say that uh, I went inside that place at the age of thirty three. So I went in there as a grown man. I didn't go in there as a stupid child. Mm-hmm. And I say that to say this, you know, uh, I was beyond the point. I have to prove anything to anybody while I was away. You know, I think I did enough, don't you think? You know, I was already convicted. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, you know, if, if my conviction doesn't tell you who I am, then something's wrong, right? So I really never had anything to prove. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I never had to go inside there and, you know, and commit another act to, to incarcerate me even deeper right. than I'm to already add at. more time. Yeah. yeah. However, um, I memorized when I was away. And, you know, if you keep me by myself, I memorize a whole book. Mm. I memorize a book called the Talata Tulu Su. Let's call it the, the Three Fundamentals, Islamic Fundamentals. And I memorized that book in Arabic and English. Wow. Yeah, That's while, amazing in itself. Yeah, yeah while I was away. So and how many pages is this book? This book was about, uh, wow, from what I remember, maybe 75, 80 pages, something like that. But that's the, uh, that you know, the Arabic is, and then you have the, right, so the English. English is like another hundred and something pages. Oh. Because it has explanations by Sheikh Uthameen, which is one of the scholars of Islam. So I memorized this book. Wow. Uh, so the longer you kept me by myself, mm-hmm. the more I would memorize. Because that would be my means of escape. I'm not thinking about the world. Mm-hmm. So I would get into a book. I go, by the time I get out this piece, I'm going to memorize this whole piece. And I memorized the whole book. You know, and when I got out, I used to teach the book. You know, and I had my own classes. And I used to teach the book. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I have to thank uh, my brother Shakur. I got to thank my brother Saw, you know, for all the help and assistance that these guys gave me while I was away. Mm-hmm. Because they helped me with the Arabic. They helped me uh, become a presenter, be mm-hmm. able to instruct. They mm-hmm. taught me how to teach. You know, and then I also have to thank uh, my brother Jihad because he also taught me how to protect myself, you know, and how to stay on, you know, on point. And who is it that I can trust and who I shouldn't trust? Mm -hmm. Cover your six, huh? That's right. So I covered it. So I learned Mm -hmm. a lot of things, you Mm -hmm. know, with my my little small community. I call it small, but we're big in there. Mm -hmm. But my little small community. The beauty of it is that we all caught the wave. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, the wave? The wave of being released. (laughs) Yes, you see that smile? 
the wave of <laughs> being <right>. released. <laughs> the wave of being released. That's okay. right. I got released, you know. Um, my boy Saad is home. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, my boy Jihad just made it home, you know. So we're, it's like we caught that wave, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I thank God that I was out here and I was, well, God placed me in a position that I'm able to assist guys that are coming out of prison with, with actual employment. Right. You know, and um, they say because I got a good gift for Gab. I don't know if it's true, but it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so let me uh, let me ask you a yeah. question. Mm-hmm. You know, they say men cry in the dark. Were, oh, did God. you have mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. nights where you shed tears, a lot of tears, and just, Whoa. you know, you were you mm-hmm. had to humble yourself? <laughs> you know, I, I have to ask well, the question. No, no, that's you know? a beautiful question. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tell you the truth. Uh, I'm glad because I shared this with a, I shared this with a, uh, a very dear friend of mine, girlfriend of mine, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, we were talking about this. I said, you know, and uh, it's something that I, it's, th- it's therapeutic for me to talk about it because if I don't talk about it, I hold it in. Mm. So uh, at night is when it becomes the most peaceful inside in the prison system. Mm. It's when quiet. People sleep and you so hear much to think about. grown men crying mm-hmm. all over the place. I'm talking about you can hear it. I'm talking about crying with the size, you know, like kids do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like what the kids do. And then you sit there and you listen to them and you be like, wow, you know. Uh, as far as me crying, I really didn't do much crying in prison, but I did cry when I heard my uncle passed away. You know, when my uncle passed away, that hit me. It hit me hard because, you know, he was like a father figure to me, mm-hmm. you know. He was crazy, you know, I'm not going to take that away. You know what I'm just saying? I'm not going to take that away. <laughs> just throw that in the mix. Yeah, yeah, he was He's crazy. crazy. You know, yeah, no, that's not big source. My uncle, my uncle Papa, his name is um, you know, Lenny. And, um, you know, but I loved him dearly for the simple fact that, you know, I, the only thing I remember is the good things. You know, I, I try to put away the bad things. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things that I used to teach, too. I used to say that, you know, we have a habit of always looking at the worst in people, but we have something to talk about. Uh, so can you write a list of anything good he does? Mm-hmm. I said, because let's look at the good that the person does. Mm-hmm. And I bet you to make it a lot easier for you to deal with it. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think I took up the field of being a social worker, because I have a lot of patience. And I look at people in their eyes and I can tell if if you're not about, you know, what you say you're about. Mm-hmm. You know, I can see. The energy. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, in your eyes you know your eyes is like the window to your soul absolutely so you know and I can look at you and I can tell that and I'm, I'm learning even more I went through it don't let's not get this you know I'm not going to tell you I came out here and I was perfect no 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 I was going through a lot of emotional issues man mm-hmm. you know first thing the world was thrown back at me quick wait 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 so let's backtrack just a little quick. bit because I'm trying to yeah. follow go follow ahead. the timeline here. Go ahead. So after 16 and a half years, you mm-hmm. went up to, for the board. All right, let's go. Yeah, let's start with let's that. Let's go. And then. All right, let's go. All okay. right. Um, in 2010, I graduated and I got my um, uh, my associate's degree in behavior science from uh, Mercy College. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of drama happening in prison. Uh, the Muslims we were having battles with all types of big organizations. I started to have a little fear i'm too close i was only a couple of more years before i get to see the board that i could finally make it home to my family mm-hmm. so uh i was having an issue with one of the correction officers there you know and um uh, i had to put it on paper mm-hmm. so i put it on paper man well, is it same, called a grievance it's called a grievance okay. yes it is and i had to put it on paper mm-hmm. so i put it on paper only not only to defend myself but to defend the other brothers that were also in the honor block with me that right. the, he was actually picking out because of the stuff that was going on with the muslims on in the media mm-hmm. So we were being treated differently. And because we were being treated differently, I started to say, listen, man, I'm going to put in for a transfer. Okay. So I put in for a transfer once I found out that uh, Hudson Link had expanded to Fishkill. And when Hudson Link expanded to Fishkill, they were offering a bachelor's degree Mm. in uh, organizational management. Your mom was always working, huh? Oh, was it? (laughs) Oh, I got to get out of here. This is, this, this, I got to get out of here. I didn't care about anybody. I have to get out of here. Okay. And uh, everybody who uh, followed my lead made it too. So we all out here. We all home. We all caught that wave. So um, in 2000 and, in 2000, no, in 2012, I graduated with my bachelor's degree from Niagara College. Nice. And when I graduated. And what was this in? 
this was in uh, organizational management. Okay. Okay. So I got a degree in that. And once I got that degree, then now it's all about preparation. You know what preparation for? For the board. Mm. That is the biggest interview any man can ever go through. Biggest. It, you know, I, I teach about interviews. You know, I'm an instructor. So uh, for a back to work program. So mm -hmm. I actually, you know, teach people, you know, on what is it, you know, you should, you know, expect on an interview and what is it, how you should respond. Right. There is no interview bigger than this interview that I'm talking about. Because mm. this is the interview that you got 15 minutes and if you mess up, you're going to stay there for another two years. This mm -hmm. is the way this thing goes. That's a lot of pressure. It builds yes, anxiety yes, too, yes, huh? Yes, yes, it does. Yes, mm. it does. Well, it postponed my, uh, my hearing twice. You know, for how long? Like a month. They postponed it for a month. I had to wait another month. Okay. But let me tell you how I prepared for this. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a person that didn't go to the board that I didn't go walk around and ask them, well, what did they say to you? What did they ask you? Strategy, huh? I studied this. I studied board questions for over maybe three and a half years. Then mm -hmm. I went home. They don't know. I used to memorize that stuff. And then take it back and then write it in the book. Mm. And then I had a guy that I'm never going to forget. His name is Chris. And you know him too. And we used to sit back and we used to rehearse. I used to go, yo, um, if I ask you this, I, what you going to say? And he would ask me. And, then, and we used to do this like we walk down, you know, and he used to say, I got something for you. I bet you ain't got an answer for this one. And he would, add, he would answer that question. Yeah. And sometimes we would answer the questions, but it would seem like it's not correct because it seems so harsh. Mm. Right. But the reality is, is that you committed a crime. And the minute that you you straight, you get away from the details on how you committed it, then they, they you know, they, their answer to it is that minimizing. Yeah. You're minimizing it. And you're also what they call it. You're not acknowledging. You're not taking exactly. a, being accountable and responsible for exactly. your actions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, is that, OK, you committed this crime. And it happened in this detail. The details is like this. Mm -hmm. And don't leave anything out. You know why? Because they have the minutes in front of them. Mm -hmm. They know exactly what happened. Don't, and matter of fact, you need to read those minutes before you go to that board. Make mm -hmm. sure that you don't make no mistakes. Because if you don't read them minutes and they got some stuff in them minutes that they ain't supposed to have, you better get it removed. Because if you don't, that's what they're going to that's what they're gonna be looking at. They're holding you accountable exactly. for what's in the minutes. Exactly. So there was times that you would answer the question and I would say, and I would tell him, I said, look, I don't hold no punches. I'm going to say exactly what happened and how I did it. And he go, ah, oh, man, I don't know, man, if you should do that. No, yeah, I am going to do that. That's exactly what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. But you know what was the beauty about this whole thing? I was walking down the corridor, right? And uh, when I finally got to go to the board, mm -hmm. <laughs> finally, I have to remember they postponed it twice. <laughs> they postponed that thing twice, so I'm going crazy. Okay. So when I finally... You know, made it down the board. I had got a whisper, man, from a person that sounded like my grandmother. Mm. And she told me in Spanish, she said, this is the last time you're ever going to walk down here. Say it in Spanish. She said, esta va a ser la última vez mm. que tu andas por aquí. Mm. And I felt it like it was her. You know, it was just her. And uh, Tina Stanford was, uh, well, she was on the board. She's the head commissioner. And uh, when I walked in, she didn't, I didn't sit down. She said, before you sit down, I have something to say. And she said, uh, I called everybody and to see if anybody, you know, has anything, you know, to say about you mm. <laughs> not being released. And she said, we haven't found anybody that disapproves of your release. Mm. She said, however, we did receive one letter. You know who that letter was from? Mm. And I'm never going to be ashamed to say, but that letter came from my mother, man. My mother actually sent a letter to the parole board for they won't release me. But just show you how big God is. God is so big, it don't matter who they who sent that letter. Because uh, the issues that she was having with my, with the woman that held me down for 16 and a half years went so far that it went down to the point that she even would like for me to stay in jail in order to make her own sister suffer. That's some real wild stuff. So, I, so imagine going to the board knowing that this hat that the good possibility they may not release you because of that letter did they tell you not to break you oh my god i don't know mm -hmm. but i know what she did tell me she said well today you don't have to worry about that because i'm gonna be your mother uh, what are you gonna do when you get home mm -hmm. and when she said that i felt it in my heart like to say yo this woman gonna let me go 
And do you know who I seen on that board? Who? There were no men. There was three women. So I put an image to each one of them. Mm. I seen I seen a, a grandmother, mm. a mother, and an aunt. Mm. And I said, this is my board. Because I know that I can reach these women. I know. I could do it. And I did. I really did. And uh, the beauty... And, and what was so what was such a big blessing out of it is that I really didn't have to explain why I was in prison, <laughs> why I went to prison. All of that stuff I rehearsed. I didn't have to use any of it. Mm-hmm. None of it. Mm-hmm. And so all, who guided your words? What guided your words? What guided my words is being truthful. That was what guided my words. I, was, I didn't I, I didn't have no reason to lie. I did what I did. I'm not going to say I didn't do it. I did what I did. Mm -hmm. And I took full responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And by taking full responsibility for it, then there's no reason for any details to be left out. So what got in my words is the truth. What am I going to lie for? Mm -hmm. But she didn't want to know about that. She wanted to know about my journey and this educational journey that I went through while you was incarcerated. How did you do it? How did you, how was you one of the leaders of the Muslims, and you did 16 and a half years in prison. That's what she said. And you never even got a ticket? <laughs> That's what she told me. I said, no, I didn't get a ticket. She said, how did you manage that? I said, God knows best. <laughs> I said, God knows best. I don't know how it happened, mm-hmm. but I didn't even get a ticket. And um, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate. You know, I was fortunate because you get a ticket for not anything. Yes. But I happened to be one of those that just didn't get one. And I wanted to ask you, too, about the um, yeah. your experience with, with the officers. Because some people say, you know, if you respect them, they'll respect you. Or sometimes people are overzealous and they take their mm. job a little bit too far. Mm. Um, they can mistreat you. They can say certain things that mm. because they know they're in a position to say things to you that mm. may just, you know, it, it's almost like a strategy just to break you down That's to right. get you to that point where, you know, look, Mm. You're no longer thinking about, you know, your goals. Yeah. You know, you're no longer thinking about your family. It's now, okay, you're disrespecting me. So now I have to mm. defend myself in a different way. Yes. So did you experience that with any officers? Well, not really. It's the way you carry yourself. Okay. You know, I was respect. You know, I, I showed respect and got respected. However, just because it didn't happen to me, it didn't mean it didn't hurt me when it happened to someone else. Right. Because what happens is that when we all wear green, we become a body. mm so whatever's being done to one is being done to you mm-hmm. because you don't know why you don't know when you're going to be picked right you understand so i've seen a lot of abuse lots of it so and i always say this and i, I have to emphasize it that i've never seen more abuse from my own people that come from my own hoods mm. than i ever seen in my life until i got incarcerated wow we have another caller javier mm-hmm. hi caller who am i speaking with hi my name is michael Hi, Michael. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Queens, New York. Okay. Mm. Do you know Javier, Michael? I do. He is a family friend. Okay. Wow. All right. So um, what do you want to say? Do you have a statement? Do you have any questions for Javier? I do. I have a question. Uh, a little combination of a statement and a question. Okay. Um, well, I, I wanted to commend him for, for making the positive choices uh, with his situation. Because a lot of people... They don't really have the mental strength to do something like that. And um, my main question is, uh, being a young man myself, and I, I see a lot of guys not as fortunate as myself, they, they go down the wrong path. And um, I want to ask him mm-hmm. uh, if he could recall what contributed to his lifestyle prior to being incarcerated. What, what would you say or recommend to a young man going down the wrong path that could give them the same mental strength that he had and maybe push the push them in the positive direction before they make the same mistake great question hmm. beautiful you? question i would like to answer that question this way because that's really my goal and the, and the mindset that i had when i was released from incarceration and that was one of the things that i said to the board uh, before I was released that they asked me what can I contribute to the community and I was saying that I would probably be able to assist people in a way of not you know and showing them a direction other than the footsteps that I had taken in order to cause me to, to cause so much pain not only to the family of the, of the deceased but my own family for going for being in, for being sentenced and being incarcerated now the direction that I took before I was incarcerated is because I wanted to be a part of 
Mm. And that was one of the biggest and major mistakes that I've made, you know, that I wanted to be a part of. Uh, I never learned uh, my criminal behavior from my home. My grandmother was not a criminal. My grandfather was not a criminal. And definitely uh, my cousins and my aunt and none of them were actual criminals. I mean, none of them were criminals at all. So I didn't learn any of that stuff from home. I learned all of that stuff from the street. And I grew up in a pretty good neighborhood. However, there were people out there that drew attention that I wanted, you know, and me following and looking for that type of attention is what caused me to start making the wrong choices in life, like getting high, drinking, smoking, uh, robbing, stealing, all of those type of things. It's not because I needed it because my family gave me all the money I ever needed. I was the only I was like the only boy running around the house. I actually made the mistake of making the wrong choice by trying to be a part of. And I think that's one of the major mistakes that a lot of the youth have we have um, that that I see today that I speak to all the time are doing today, that they become part of these organizations because they want to be a part of something. And that is something that you should not be focused on. You should be focusing on what are you going to do for your family and how is it in what direction you're going to take in life to take care of yourself? Mm. Then you'll be able to make the best decisions in your life. As long as you're trying to be a part of especially those groups that hang on corners and hang on them liquor stores and hang all over the place doing the wrong thing. And if you want to be a part of them because of the, uh, of the, of the attention that they're getting, then guess what? You're heading in the wrong direction. Mm. You're definitely heading in the wrong direction. And that was one of my mistakes. I mean, I'm not going to say mistake. I don't like using the word mistake. That was one of my wrong choices. And I am and I recognize it now. And I wish that I was able to start all over again because I would have never made that choice again. Never. Mm. All right. Was that helpful, Michael? That was, that was extremely helpful. <laughs> I, I don't know. It pierced my soul with. just now. This mm -hmm. is a deep conversation here. We have Michelle mm -hmm. on Facebook. She said, when are you writing that book? Uh, tell <laughs> I, oh, my God. Tell her I started to write a book. It's called Whispers. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Michael, do you have anything else to add to the conversation? Mm -hmm. No, I think that was huge. I, I, you know, I, I agree with him. That guys always feel like they have to be a part of something. Yeah. And sometimes standing alone and, and showing that you have your own strength is, is a big deal. Yes. And I, I'm glad to hear him say that because I, I would have never put it together. And, and coming from somebody that's actually been in that situation mm -hmm. is, you know, like they always say, experience is the best teacher. And I couldn't get it, you know, couldn't get the truth, the raw truth from mm -hmm. anyone else better than I could get it from him. So thanks a lot, Huff. All right. All, All right. right. Thank you for calling in, Mike. Thanks for the support. Mm -hmm. No problem. Anytime. All right. All Have right. a great night. Wow. You too, good night. Okay. Yeah. So, ooh. <laughs> I knew this conversation would be impactful. Yes. Um, you know, yes. there's so many um, of us, and I include myself, that, mm -hmm. that are dealing with family members who are or who have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, being on the other end of the spectrum of being a family member, having to deal with another family member incarcerated is very, very difficult. Yes. Um, it's difficult to take yourself away from that person's presence. You know, yes. it's difficult to adjust to that person not being there. Um, yes. And especially if that person was very dear to your heart. Um, and as close as a mother, a father, a brother, yes. mm -hmm. um, as we have heard, a cousin, sister, mm -hmm. uncle, yes. you know, or even a friend, yes. you know, and, and so many people need that support, not only the ones who are incarcerated, but the families of the incarcerated. Yes. Um, so I know that you are, you mm -hmm. are a part of a community organization. You're working with workforce, you said, or you're no, working with the program. It's, yeah, it's a, uh, I was a part of a group called the Life is Program, and this mm -hmm. program actually reaches out to the mothers of incarcerated, of incarcerated, you know, teenagers. Wow. And um, um, one thing that I do have to say that's very important when it comes to that mm -hmm. is that that your, your loved one's strength comes from you. The minute that they see you break down, they're going to break down. Excuse me. They're going to break down, you know. You have to, you can't go up there and all of a sudden lose, you know, 50 pounds and go up there looking like, you know, you're, like you're just sick. You can see that you're just stressed. Right. Because if you show your loved one that that's what you're going through, then he's going to lose strength. He's going to lose strength himself, mm -hmm. you know, because you become his strength. You know, one thing I have to say, even though my aunt suffered a lot, mm -hmm. my aunt and us 
by you know our connection our spiritual connection with the higher power that we believe in uh allow her to be able to stay just as strong as i was mm. and so i was always happy to see her because she always looked good mm -hmm. you know and that made me that made me strong because i could see she could deal with it you know and you uh, um correct me if i'm wrong but you didn't pacify negativity no. so even if something was going on with you yes. you kind of dealt with it in mm -hmm. the in Yes. Um, in the best way that you could yeah. and vice versa I think yeah. sometimes when family mm -hmm. members visit other family members or they call and stuff mm -hmm. like that um, the, you know the inmates call their family members sometimes they bring on extra drama extra stress and yes. then vice versa if something is going on in the community that's not so good like the kids are acting exactly. up or someone passed away or yes. you know they're mm -hmm. stressed financially however yeah. the case may be and they exactly give you that information mm -hmm. yeah. that mm -hmm. is kind of ways it's a lot of tension on you exactly yeah exactly it is a lot of tension and you sometimes you know being a family member of a person that's incarcerated you have to i know it's difficult don't get it you know don't don't think that it's I, i'm not trying to say that you know this is something you're just going to snap and out of nowhere you're going to just become strong it's not going to work like that mm -hmm. that is your son or whoever it is that's incarcerated that you love you love mm -hmm. and then you know that's nothing going to separate that however when you start to um, exercise to condition yourself in dealing with your loved one's situation mm -hmm. then it helps the person in the situation it has to because if you if you lose focus uh he's gonna lose focus mm -hmm. and especially when it comes to your mother mm -hmm. you know when your mother loses focus then i've seen guys break down mm -hmm. um no more than about two, uh five days after i was incarcerated there was a, a friend of mine his name i'm never gonna forget him his name was um they used to call him i think his, his, vargas his name was vargas and I had just met him. I used to cook for him. You know, we used to cook for each other. I'd make rice and beans, pass it over. We used to pass it from one gate. We cooked in hot pots, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I, I became a pro. So, <laughs> I used to cook in hot pots and pass food over. Mm -hmm. um, he, he got a letter. A Dear John letter. Mm. Yeah. yeah. He had, a, uh, um, he had a, a wife and she had five children from him. And uh, she must. She sent him a letter saying that, uh, you know, whenever you do make it home, don't expect to knock on this door. Well, anyway, when I went to child the very next day, you know, he hung himself. So my first experience in 1999 is to go look past a guy that I'm talking to, like almost every other night, and go look up there and see the guy hanging from, from the shelf. Mm. And I said, wow, because I was just talking to him. And I said, what is it that this guy went through last night, you know, that will cause him to want to take his own life? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the Dear John letter came up and they read it and, you know, then the information got around the jail. Uh, that was what really made me make a decision that I don't need no ties while up up in here. <laughs> you know, I'm not lying because I need I need to make sure I make it through and right. I don't really need no other extra headaches. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I basically made a choice to do this time on my own. Mm -hmm. You know, and I did it on my own. Right. Uh, never have to wait for a Dear John letter because there's no one going to write it to me. <laughs> you know, so it's real. But he's not the only one. You know, I've seen about four or five suicides since I've been in there. So, you know, guys, you know, take their lives for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it, a lot of times it's because... <laughs> Yes. Stress. Family members not having yeah. enough support and things yes. of that nature. And yes. I know on the, mm -hmm. um, the contrary, a lot of mm -hmm. some people who are incarcerated, not a lot of, but some mm -hmm. people who are incarcerated have an expectation yes. that their family members are supposed to. Mm -hmm. and, and and I see it more so with the people who have high rates of recidivism, like the open door policy. You're in and out of uh, jail and serving time and you expect for your your um, family members and things like that to give you money and mm -hmm. for commissary and come and see you and exactly. accept your phone calls and put mm -hmm. money on, you know, pay for collect calls and things of that nature. Yes. What? Well, mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask you where that expectation comes from because I, I kind of can figure that part out. But how do, how do you deal with that in mm -hmm. the community, that, that, that amount of pressure? Because that is pressure. Mm, a lot of pressure. You know, and yeah. you know, matter of fact, I am going to ask the question. Go ahead. Where do they muster up the, the I want to say balls, <laughs> to, to even to have that expectation? You know where you know, it come from? Talk to me. Pure selfishness. Pure, mm -hmm. pure selfishness. 
And when I say pure selfishness, it's because uh, I've seen uh, many men, you know, commit the crimes themselves, made the choices on their own, and then expect for somebody to owe them anything because you're away. Right. You know, nobody don't owe you anything. You know, and uh, for you to think that someone owes you something, then you have a real psychological issue. Because uh, there were times I used to tell my people, I'm good, man. I, I, you know, I, I worked in prison, mm -hmm. just like I work out here. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the industry. I always kept a job. You know, it's like, you know, matter of fact, there were times I used to send money home to my mother. So it's, wow. you know, from prison. Mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, it has a lot to do with upbringing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know, you know, the way you were raised, you know. The morals that were taught to you, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things tell up, uh, you know, have they, they, you know, they, all of those factors, you know, have an effect on you, mm -hmm. all of it, you know. So, you raised the wrong way, you know, and you know, all of a sudden your kid gets locked up and he starts suspecting that you owe him all of these things, you know. Then he's got to start questioning, you know, what is it that I taught this kid when he was growing up? Right. Right. So I know you would. I know you would. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> just, on point. You, just, you know, yeah. that's the raw deal there. Yeah. That's so right. <laughs> the intimacy part yes where you not having a relationship and you know not having that connection not mm -hmm. having anybody that you're tied down to which i i mm -hmm. respect that to the fullest yeah um what was that like okay because i know people want to mm -hmm. know like how the hell like yeah. what in the world like what yeah and you people know. be saying, oh, man, you've been locked up in jail. You ain't had no woman in there. <laughs> you went and turned. Now, listen. Well, that's, the, people ask yeah, that question, too. That but question. I think it, yeah, it's possible. It's possible for you to yeah. remain, you know. Well, I'm going to tell you the truth. The dudes that do flip is because they already had it in them. Okay. You know, men are men anywhere they go. Okay. It's just the way it goes. But if you already have a feather in you, mm -hmm. then the feather starts to grow when you get into places like that. Okay. So it doesn't, you know... I feel sorry for the individual that got raped, right. you know, and it was taken from him. Mm -hmm. But if out of your own choice, you start designing to be with other men, you know, nah, brother, that that, that was a part of you before you got incarcerated. That's, right. you know, it's just it came out now that you're incarcerated. Okay. But a man going to be a man no matter where he goes. That's mm -hmm. just the way it goes. But there is an uncomfortability of like having to take well, being exposed and taking showers with a whole bunch of men and not having your own privacy and things of that nature all right of that, all of that you know it's but you know what happens is is that i'll give you a prime example one of the most uncomfortable things that can happen to you in prison is a strip search all right so let's let's just let's let's set aside that you have to take a shower with another man yeah. we're talking about an officer telling you to take off your pants and he's looking at your at your private parts and telling you to open up your cheeks and stuff because he's looking for stuff. And I know, I mean, you mentioned that real. earlier yes. before before the show that, you yeah. know, that was one of the reasons why you told your family members, listen, yeah, no, don't. because I don't want to keep going through this process. Exactly. The process of, to come in, exactly. you know, for the visitation exactly. is like exactly. crazy. Yeah, exactly. I, I got to the point that, you know, I, I just really, I, I didn't mind seeing, I loved my family, don't get it wrong, mm -hmm. especially that kid, um, Serrano, man, that's, you know, he's like, he's my brother and every all of them, all three of them, you know, Jamila, Serrano, and my aunt Sarah you know I loved when they used to come see me but I mm -hmm. didn't like what happened when I had to go back the process yeah so because of that you know I used to cut the visits down you know I don't mind y'all guys come once you know every three months or something you know I try to but bug you know I, I try not to bug my family as much because mm -hmm. the reality is it's not their fault that I'm in there it's really my fault right so you know they they you know they helped me through it they supported me you know mm -hmm. they came to all my graduations you know they seen all the things that I did while I was in there were you allowed to go to the funeral for your uncle no 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 uh-uh I, would, I didn't find out until after he was buried anyway. Okay. Because I really didn't have that much communication, um, you know, at the, you know, with my family because I used to really shut down from that too. Okay. Yeah, I know you said you yeah, had a I habit of said, isolating yeah, and things isolate like that. Yeah, I myself. So okay. there certain things I didn't do. One thing that I would like to share that, um, that was very important to me because remember I t when I started the show that I've never been incarcerated before. So the first time I was ever incarcerated, I was sentenced to 17 years. Mm -hmm. However, they offered me like almost 50. But, you know, uh, I did 16 and a half. So God was the real one in charge of how much time I was actually going to do. Right. And that's what I did. Mm -hmm. But I met an old man um, in, um, in before Brooklyn. We get, in before we get into the story, can we take the caller? Go ahead. Take All the right. Call. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to leave the no, person no, no, on the line. I got you. I got you. Hi, caller. Who am I speaking with? Mm -hmm. 
My name is Danielle Goggins. Hi, Danielle. How are you? Mm. I'm good, Miss Hayward. How are you? I'm good. So, do you have a statement or a question for Javier? Actually, it's a statement. Okay. Go ahead, Danielle. Okay. You earlier you said that um, his mind was always working. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to say his mind hasn't stopped, <laughs> even with the education that he got while he was incarcerated. Because I watch him on a daily basis, and it's not easy. He, as well as he's doing, it's still an adjustment and it's mm -hmm. still a struggle. Mm -hmm. But I watch him every day that when he encounters an, a struggle, he searches and he searches until he finds an answer that brings him some peace. And he constantly moves forward. I've watched him grow in the last year and a half, unbelievably, just emotionally and socially. Hmm. So I just want to tell him that I'm really proud of him. I, he knows that, but I'm extremely proud of him every day. Hmm. Thank that, you. That was powerful. I, that was powerful. And I love you, man. Love you, man. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. I, I, I tell I you, the, 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 these call-ins here then got me, you know, a little on edge with my tears now. Y'all got to gotta <laughs> cut this out. <laughs> wow. Right, because I have to tell you, um, I'm a mother of a 25-year-old daughter and a 26-year-old son. Mm. And I have preached all their life, don't mm. you dare date anyone who's been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You don't need them as friends. Mm -hmm. They got problems. Stay away from them. And the biggest thing was to get them to understand that he's a good guy. Mm. Mm. They're not all like that. Don't get me wrong. Because trust me, there's too much in the news. But he really is a good guy. Mm. And I, he works with my son. I trust him in the house with my daughter. Mm. He's a really amazing man. Wow. Mm. So I'm proud of him. I'm very proud of him. I think the world needs to hear that um, mm -hmm. because we set so many, uh, we have, uh, you know, we tend to have so many biases. Um, so we generalize, we, we, we place people who've been incarcerated in boxes and not everyone is, turns out the same. And as Javier has right. mentioned, you know, this was an isolated event, mm -hmm. which sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I haven't been fortunate enough to hear a story where there's an isolated event mm -hmm. where you are sentenced right. to so much time in prison. Um, and it is commendable, you know, how he was able to keep his mind right and get focused within a small amount of time and and get right. educated and educate others and then come out into the community and still right. struggle with the fact that he was incarcerated for this this amount of time and then he lost his family and he it, it, it was just so much to deal with so it is a, a commendable yeah. and again i appreciate and um the call and the statement go ahead danielle go ahead okay no i'm sorry and i was going to say what intrigued me most because I, I i knew javier when i was 12. i grew up in the same neighborhood with him but we lost touch by the time i was like maybe 17. Uh -huh. 18. but when we reconnected a year and a half ago what intrigued me so much about him hmm. was his level of hope hmm. because i mean i've i've gone through experiences where i've for me life sucked it, it just did but listening to him is like if he could be so hopeful, why can't you? Right. So, his, I mean, for him, there's never a downside. If there's a problem, let's find a way to fix it. I'm going to make it work. I will never be the person that they thought I was because mm. I'm not that man. That's right. Hmm. And he truly, truly is not. He really is not. When he used to talk about being incarcerated, I told him, you're not that person. That was, that, that was happenstance. Hmm. But amazing man he is and i just wanted to shout him out and let him know i feel that way thank you so much and for that else too. <laughs> <laughs> full of awesomeness thank you so much for calling in and the support we appreciate it you're welcome have a great Hi, night all right you too danielle bye-bye <laughs> toss it hi danielle <laughs> she well, hung up she probably got you on the radio all right anyway. wow <laughs> yeah ah mm -hmm. yes yeah that's deep and you and, and you sitting here, you sweating. Where's the, when is the tear gonna come oh, out? I, I see your eye, you getting all red. Yeah, that, you know your eyes getting a little oh, watery. Man, you know, a little you holding, you holding, holding it together. Holding you holding it, it together. I'm holding it. Together. it. I'm holding it. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know what can I say? Even even my outside, even outside of my family, there's love being. You know, it's like I'm the support that my friends have been giving me and. Uh, people that i've been with it's just been amazing but you know i really say that a lot of this doesn't really come from me mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with you know what my higher power prepared for me mm. you know because proper preparation prevents yes. poor performance huh mm -hmm. 
because that embracement is like you know it's there was nothing that I did not touch since I've been home that didn't turn into gold mm. nothing I, I got a job two weeks after I got released so do you think that because <laughs> um, before I know you wanted to tell us a story yeah. but do you think that it was necessary for you to go through this um, for you to become the person that you are today Okay, well, I'm going to say, I wish I didn't go through it, mm -hmm. but I am going to say this, though. Um, because I did go through it, it, uh, it changed my whole perspective on life. Mm -hmm. You know, it made me appreciate it. You know, it, it put me in a, in a position that I'm, you know, in the mindset of, of, you know, learning to appreciate even the smallest things in life. You know, uh one of the biggest things that I like to do is to bring a smile to a woman's face, you know, and uh, and especially, you know, it's very difficult for me to, to have a relationship with someone and not tell them I love them because love is a, it's not only what you say, but it, because when I say it, it comes actions. from my heart. Mm -hmm. When I say it, it comes from my heart, but actions had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I learned that, you know, as time goes on, that it's not so much of that, but there's a reason why I always tell my mother I love her. And the reason why I always tell my mother I love her is because I always have in my mind that if anything ever happened to her, then at least the last thing that I said is that I love you. So, with her, it's, I don't say hi, ma. I say, I love you, ma. Mm -hmm. And when I get off that phone, I say, I love you, ma. Mm -hmm. And I say it as much as I possibly can because if, let us just say that the next time I call, she's not around. I can say that the last thing I said is I love you. Mm -hmm. and yeah. what does that do for you what it does to me is that uh, it makes me it makes it, it lifts my spirit okay. it really does it lifts my spirit and the fact that you don't hold grudges no uh, because bitterness yeah. you know when, when you mm -hmm. harbor bitterness it just yes. it does more um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it it impacts you in yeah. a in a in a worse way in the yes, worst way exactly. then it, you know because you're feeling like oh i'm i'm just treating this person uh mm -hmm. not so good but when you harbor bitterness it destroys you from the mm -hmm. inside out yeah you know so i definitely yeah. get that yes. you know i mean going back to the um story that you said about you know when you went before the board and you got yeah. this letter and your mom was the person who wrote the letter and then for yeah. you to say to your mother i love you before and after yeah. is commendable well actually too. when i'm saying my mother let's not get confused oh <laughs> Wait, wait, am I jumping the gun? Are you yeah, talking about yeah, your yeah. aunt? I'm talking about my aunt. <laughs> that, you know, I call my aunt my aunt. Oh, well, happy <laughs> year, you were supposed to roll with that. Yeah, 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 I, I, I can't but roll. Then, but, but then, it, truthful, you are truthful. No, I'm truthful with mm -hmm. it. I do, I am the one always calling my aunt my mother. Yes, okay. no doubt about that. Okay. I, do I still love my, my, my maternal mother? Of course I do. Okay. Of course I do. But there are some people that you love, the further the way they're from you, the, the more you love them. Okay. You know, and okay. you know. I respect let that. us not let us not think that you know anybody has to be subjected to torture or subjected to being stressed out just because the person is your blood that is true no absolutely not if i don't get along with you yeah i love you but uh, i love you at a distance the right anything stay, that's causing stress exactly. or havoc in your life you that's, must rid of it i i, I, I respect you, that further you stay with me more i love you that's the way i like it i respect you that. know i'm saying and for those that i can embrace and tell them that i love them and show them that i love them and appreciate them and and those are the type of things those are the people i keep near me that's right you know i don't have time first thing life is short that's number one. Oh yes and uh <laughs> I, and you know and i am 54 you know and, and believe it or not when you reach your 50s if you're not enjoying those 50s man listen brother you're not gonna enjoy too much after that anyway mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know because to me this is my prime my prime is i'm still i still can play ball right <laughs> is no, that no. all y'all talk about is ball? That's no. Like, that's, you know I'm saying? I still can play I basketball. I still can play ball. That's right. You know, I'm not at the age I can't play the way I still can play <laughs> basketball. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you not know. Not now, Tom. Yeah, that's right. So, you <laughs> we know, ain't talking about no basketball right now. <laughs> so, I'm still, I still feel young, you know. So, but uh, uh, when I say that I enjoy things, it's like if I bring, like, back in the days, you go buy a gift, you know, to your, to the, your girlfriend and everything. And you feel good about it, yeah. right? But it's different when you're in your 50s and you do it. It's different. You appreciate it. It's, it's, it's something like about the appreciation appreci of it. It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it's like, it's, it touches you. Mm. You know, it's like, wow, man, I, you know, I, I brought a smile to this woman's face. You know what I'm saying? Little thing. It could be a small thing, but it's the smile itself was enough. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you're younger, you really don't understand the meaning of it. You want that smile. Mm. Like I make fun of glass of tea. 
There you go. Yeah. Small. Yeah, it makes his night. Yeah. Yeah, when he makes me Just a, a glass of tea or ask me if I'm hungry or, exactly. you know, something like that. Yeah, you so, have yeah. to appreciate those little things. You got to mm-hmm. appreciate everything. You know, for a little while, I was having all types of emotional issues and things mm-hmm. of that nature because I had to learn to readapt and, you know. But which is natural. Which is natural. And understand that, uh, okay, yes, I wasn't in a relationship for the past 16 and a half years. So one of the biggest obstacles for me is how, you know, how am I going to deal with my emotional attachment to somebody now after not being emotionally attached? To nobody for 16 and a half years right all right how am i gonna react to it you mm-hmm. know so you know for a long time i kept pushing people away you know i pushed people away from me because i didn't want that right. you know but you know now that that i'm starting to mature i have to call it and i hope some of the listeners listening to this emotionally right yeah emotionally you know i'm, I'm starting to mature <laughs> i'm here you being bad you turn around <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I have mature. <laughs> so now that I have matured, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm getting a little better. Look at how he is. You know what I'm saying? He's something else. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm getting a little better. He's starting trouble. That's what you know he's doing. He's starting trouble. I'm here starting trouble. Yeah, a little something. something. All right, so let's yeah. take me back to that moment. And yes. I, 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 mm-hmm. I'm going to try to visualize this with you, right? Got you. You're walking through that corridor as you heard that silent voice or that vo- that whisper that sounded like your aunt. That sounded like my grandmother. Your grandmother, that you're never going to come back through here again, exactly. which was factual yes right you walk into that corridor and then you f- and, and you get in there and and you find out that you're being released what mm-hmm. was that feeling like well this is crazy because um by you know hearing the whisper first and then making it inside the the room and just hearing the because they don't tell you that they're going to actually release you there However, in the way she worded it, it's like, what you going to do when you get when you go home? You know? Ah, so that that's gave like, you the it's inclination. It's like giving me, yeah, that I'm going to be released. What happened was that um, they don't give you your, uh, your decision until about maybe five days later or three days later. Four. They make you sit? They make you wait. What are you Ooh. talking about? This is not a joke. You got to wait. Oh. So anyway, I was, they, I was the only one called down on a Thursday. I remember that on a Thursday mm-hmm. and they had my letter on the table. It was a sergeant and my letter was on the table and it, and it was written in green. So what green mean? Money. Go. <laughs> green oh, go, go. Go. Yeah, go. I said money. Yeah, no, but yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Go, go. It means go. You know, like you see a green okay. light. You see All right, a green go, light. Go. go. Yes, obviously, right? right? Okay. So I look at the green and I said, yo, green. Wow, that looked like go to me, right? So I went to go open it up, and the sergeant said, "No, you can't do that here." I said, "Come on, uh, come on, Sarge, man. I've been in here for sixty and a half years. I can't wait." So I just started opening. She got up from around the hut seat, and she went and gave me a hug and embraced me. She said, "Good wow. luck." She said, "Good luck out there." I said, "You already knew." And I said to my sister, "She already knew the decision." Did you cry? No. Did no not tears? Yet. No not nothing? Yet. Not yet. I'm gonna tell you when I cry. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, so wait, wait. Because I'm, I'm curious now, Go right? So we, we, we in the meat and potatoes now. We grinding. Go ahead. Go ahead. So when you finally found out that you were going to be released, mm-hmm. did that message spread around the prison? And how did everybody else react to you? They were happy for me. Okay, good. They I were know happy. Some people, no. uh, for some people, yeah. they go through like a period where other people may try to build infractions and hold them exactly. back and things like that. There's like a lot of different challenges. Exactly. Did you have to face any of that? No, they were happy for me. I guess because okay. I was I was like really connected with uh, the population, Good. you know, and mm-hmm. because I was really con- But a lot of people like I, I used to write letters for people who didn't know how to write. You know, I used to, you know, help people out in certain things. I even helped guys through college and stuff like that. You know that you okay. know they needed to have some ideas to do their last papers, and I would help them out with the with the ideas and everything. I wrote my paper on uh, uh, women in ministry mm-hmm. and uh, because and women leaders basically, but I, I called it women in ministry. But it's really the whole topic, forty pages of why women should lead. Mm. You know, and you know, okay. I like to read that. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, I would tell you, I catered to the professor because she was a woman, of course. You know what time it is, but mm-hmm. I'm trying to get the best grade. 
So I'm trying to be that. Getting himself into some trouble with what he's doing. Look at Tarka I'm trying to get the best grade, you know, so be that to try to get the best grade. You know, so be that to try to get the best grade. So I just figured, listen, you know, and she was a she was a minister herself. Mm-hmm. So, and then, you know, I went in. Uh, you peeping uh, the body language, yeah, right? He start turning yeah, red. He start yeah, doing I this. Know, and then the, the back stuff. of the hand. Oh Go God. back in. Yeah. So, you know, I started looking for stuff. <laughs> So that's what I wrote it on, and then I helped okay. everybody else with theirs. You know? All right, I okay. did mine way before it was time. You know? All right, and that jump start, you're released. So, yeah, I'm released. How I, long did it take after the five days? How long did it take for you actually be released? That's another question I wanted okay, to know. Okay, I got a month later. Oh, let me tell that part. Yeah, well, because okay. this was like the reason why I did this is so important because this was the beginning of a journey that I never that, put it this way. It's almost like going into a world that you don't know anything about. That's why, you know, there were guys that you, I used to talk out of not trying to take their lives. All right. I said, you you got in when you was incarcerated, right? They put the handcuffs on you. They brought you inside of here. Mm. And then all of a sudden you go into this world, but you now you know what this world is like, right? And then you have a possibility of going back to that world out there in the, in the street with, that you just left. But I said, but if you take your life, man, you, ain't nobody ever came back from that, from the spirit world and came back and said, well, this is what's going on. That's a good analogy. So I said to myself, you know, why would you be so much in a rush to take your own life and go into a world that you know nothing about? Mm. And there is no coming back. Because you can't go and take your life and then say, I changed my mind. But you can change your mind in prison. An option of choices. Yes, you can change your mind in prison. Mm-hmm. You can start doing the things that you need to do to get back out in the street where you mm-hmm. can get back with your family again and start your life over. Mm-hmm. But if you go in there and you hang yourself, listen, partner, there is no coming back. So if you don't understand that, then all right, hopefully tonight you figure it out. Then the next day they'll wake up and go, yo... They I'm stinking. No, they would. They, they could. You know, they they, they called me Abdul Four. So he said, Abdul Gafour, I thought about what you said. You absolutely right, man. I'm gonna just live this out. Yeah, live this out, brother. Live this out, cause you would hate to die. And all of a sudden, God places in front of you uh, a video tape of what could have happened if you would have lived. <laughs> well, and social, you, know you know that's motivational saying? interviewing yeah, that you did, right? That's right. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah. What could have happened if you would have lived? Did you was? Can I go back? Can I? No, it's no, too late, my exactly. brother. Exactly. <laughs> it's no. too late. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of guys I did talk about it. Just, you know this wild thinking that they had up in there. Mm-hmm. You know because uh, I, me that thought never crossed my mind. You know I'm going home. You know I don't care what I got to do to get there. I'm going home. So I never really thought about ever taking my own life, you know. Mm-hmm. And until today, I'm still not thinking about taking my own life. We're going to live this thing out until it's time for me to go. That's right. And when it's time for me to go, you know how I want to go? There's two ways you can leave this earth. You can leave this earth in one way. And I mean, two ways, right? Mm-hmm. One of the most negative ways you can leave is that people are so happy that you left. Even the dogs and the cats are happy that you left. Mm. Why? Because every time you see the dog, you kick it. See a cat, you kick the cat. Mm-hmm. And every person that go by, you always had an evil look or something evil to say. Mm-hmm. And said, you know, so when you die, people couldn't wait for you to die. Oh, man, bury him. Hurry up. Get him in that ground. Well, I don't want to leave that way, man. I want to leave that people miss me, man. You know what I'm saying? I remember how this individual was when he was around. You know, righteousness lasts a lot longer than Al Capone's reputation. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. That's why they still talk about all the biblical people, right? Mm-hmm. Because of their righteousness, you know. Al Capone, they got other gangsters that take his place. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Am I absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, they got Another a bunch of analogy. gangsters that take their place. Yes, you absolutely. Know? That's right. So, you know, I, I want to leave Earth, you know, where people still care about me, man. Yeah, that's the way I want to leave. So, I'm doing. I'm getting better at it. Mm-hmm. I am. It's a work in progress, right? We're yeah, all well, perfectly getting imperfect. Better. Getting better. Right. right. Maturing. Exactly. I'm looking into the camera. Right. Maturing. maturing. I'm maturing. <laughs> He said it right again. He yep. gave it. I'm maturing. <laughs> you know, what can right. I say? <laughs> All right. So you get home. Yeah. And and what is this like for you? Another Now it's like an, entering another world. Reentry now. It was reentry. It was a world that I, I, I never forgot how it, you know, how I lived it. I mm-hmm. just didn't like the way I was living it. But I knew about being free. Because remember, I, I was in Castro at the age of 33. So I lived a good portion of my life out there in the world. Right. So, um... The, the problem is that, it, uh, that, I, that I encountered in coming back and reintegrating uh, back into society was that things happened too fast for me. Mm. 
you know, I got a, I went to a three quarter house, and I got a job in two weeks. Right. How long were you in the three quarter house? And who gave you the lead to go into the three quarter house? Well, that was my own plan. Okay. And the reason why it was my own plan is because I set, uh, I had a strategy. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I'm not going to be one of them type of guys that leave prison and then try to do everything on my own. Right. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to utilize every program that they had out there in the world that assists mm -hmm. the formerly incarcerated. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the people who was incarcerated before. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why, they have places like Fortune Society, Osborne, CEO, uh, Ready, Willing, and Able. They got mm -hmm. all of these type of places that are willing to assist you. Right. You know, but all of a sudden, you turn around and got an attitude and think you're going to do it all on your own. Mm -hmm. And then when you can't do it, then you go revert back to the, in to the individual that you were before you went to prison. That's right. All Which right. Which makes little to no sense. Okay. So, I know I need some therapy. Mm -hmm. So, I went into Osborne and I became, I, you know... I needed therapy. In so the I Bronx or Brooklyn? It's no in uh, Northern Boulevard. Okay. All right, in Queens. Okay, in Queens. That's right. Okay. So I started going in the, there, and I started sitting in the circles. I started listening to them. They mm -hmm. they helped me with my resume. They mm -hmm. checked me out, mm -hmm. made sure I wasn't sick. They had seen their doctors. You know, and everything was free because I just came out of prison. So because I came out of prison, I just utilized everything they give me. Mm -hmm. I got a I got involved well with a program called the CEO program. Mm -hmm. And the CEO no program CEO. assists you in trying to find employment. Mm -hmm. So what Can't happens is, is while they're assisting you with employment, they pay you $50 a day. Mm -hmm. You don't get to a clean stipend. around mm -hmm. and stuff like that. They give you boots and all these things. Give you clothes, suits. So, I, I, you know, I used all of that. Mm -hmm. I had no shame in my game. I went over there and got public assistance, too. I ain't playing. Right. And whatever help they can give me, I'm going to utilize it. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not coming out here thinking I could just do this thing on my. I listen. Mm -hmm. I'm just not going to try it. I'm going to make sure that I'm going to use. I'm going to use everything that I possibly can to help me get back on my feet. That's right, and be stable. Guess what? All of a sudden, I went and got sent to a job. Right, my first interview. And when I got sent to my first interview, uh, and this was after two weeks. This is two weeks. Ooh. After two weeks, I got sent to my first interview. And when I got sent to my interview, the person told me I was overqualified. <laughs> so that was the first letdown. You know, you know, you, know, mm -hmm, you, you mm -hmm. just came out. You don't want no letdowns. But first letdown. Mm -hmm. However, I said, do, do you mind if I complete the interview? And she said, no, absolutely not. So I said, all right, well, let me, let me tell you my story. Was this a way to prepare yourself for the next interview? Yes. Okay. Yes. I'm learning. I, I said yes. So when I, because I haven't been in the interview, who knows how long. Mm -hmm. So I turned around and I, I told her my story. I told her what I, the things that I've accomplished, you know, where I was, where I've been. Mm -hmm. And then she, uh, I said, well, you know, thank you for listening. You know, it's because this is therapeutic for me. Um, you have a nice day. While I was walking out the door, the woman ran outside and said, wait a minute, Mr. Duracut, come here. I said we can't use you because this is a woman's shelter, and I don't think you're going to really fit in this spot. Mm -hmm. But we do have somebody that will hire you mm. quickly. So I was hired. Yes. You know, at 333 Bowery Street. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Let's take Go the ahead. next take caller the real call. quick. Yes, take the caller. Hmm? Hey, caller, who am I speaking with? You are speaking with Javier's auntie uh, slash hi. mom. <laughs> hi, auntie slash mom. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing fine, and I'm sitting here crying, and I'm so emotional and so proud of my son. Mm -hmm. And oh. I didn't think I was going to get through because I'm not too smart with dialing the phone, so I did it for my home phone because I didn't want to miss the interview. And I just want to say that I am so happy and so thankful to God that he has blessed us and blessed us with his freedom and how much he has accomplished. And I love him. And he knows that I love him. He's like my son. I changed his diapers. I took him to school before, to, to the babysitter before I went to school. I picked him up. And I, he's my son. He's my son. And I love him. And I just want you to know how proud he's made me. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my goodness, goodness, mom! I'm gonna say, mom, thank you. Okay. And 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 you you broke me. I'm in tears. Have a good I'm night. In, I'm I in just, tears with you. This is tears of happiness. Happiness. I have many tears of of sadness. But you know what? I knew he was gonna come out because he was raised to be a good person. And I shed so many tears of sadness, but today I shed tears of joy. 
Thank you so much for calling in for that. Okay, thank you. We appreciate you. We love you. Love you. Bye. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Cool. All right. I think I'm pretty much done for the night. <laughs> <laughs> she got me. Yeah. She got me. And I kept telling myself, I said, Jamea, you know, you're going to be all right. You know, you're not, you're not even going to have no tears tonight. Oh, my goodness. Somebody else. I was not expecting <laughs> that. All right. Yeah. So let's, let, let me just roll right on in. Let me wipe my tears real quick. All right. We got another call on the line. Mm. Hi, caller. Who am I speaking with? Hi, this is Tom Corley. Hi, mm. Tom. I'm from 157th Street. Yes. Hey, Tom from 157th Street. <laughs> you know are you I a, know who you, you are. You're a friend or family <laughs> or both? Um, he's like family. That's my chili man right there. I'm all right, right <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for calling in. Um, Do you have a statement or you have a question? or? Well, here's what I'd like to say. Um, With all the, the transitions and all the challenges the men of color have faced, I'm really proud of the brother that's sitting across from me because even though we haven't talked in a while, he's been in my thoughts and in my heart, you know, that he's kept his spirit up, that there are those that cared about him and thought about him. And I'm proud of you, brother. Thank you, you know, man. I'm proud of you. Mm. You're the power of example. Yeah, thank wow, you. Wow, thank you. Example, man. Thank Listen you. to that. Oh, mm. my goodness. So much support. That's my so man, much yeah. love. Flash. I'm yeah. saying. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give it up, right? All the way from 157th Street. Uh, that's right. <laughs> I know Todd over there somewhere, too. Todd is magic. Yeah. He's <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are we talking basketball again? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Y'all just can't stay away so from the basketball. From, that's religion. the connection. What's up, TC? Yes. Hey, what's up, Todd? How you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, thank you so much for calling in, TC. We appreciate you. And you keep doing what you're doing, because you all you and Todd are the power couple. Oh, thank and you so much. We I, appreciate I, I, you. I think it's fantastic that you got my man Javier on there, hmm. and uh, it's great to see him. And Javier, hit me up, man. I've been talking to Sarah, you know, off and on, back and forth. Definitely, Hit I will. Me up man. when you're free, brother. Definitely, yes, I will. Yes, we're looking at a family reunion, a big Definitely. one at that. Thank right? you, thank you, Tommy. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Thank, thank you, you so much for calling, and we we appreciate you. Got you. All uh, right. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Oh, thank all right. you. Same to you. Yes. All right mm-hmm. now. All mm-hmm. right. Wow. Oh my gracious. Mm-hmm. I was I was making a mark. I said, you know, there's not gonna be no tears. We're gonna be all right. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, gonna flow through this conversation. Yeah, no, no. Um broke me right on up, mom. <laughs> Listen to that. And she sounds so youthful. Yes, yeah, she does. Oh my goodness. Yeah, she does. She's she sounds so young. youthful. Yeah. And 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 the fact that she said at one point I was uh crying tears of, you know, I was hurt, I was broken, and now I'm I'm crying tears of joy was yeah. was Mm-hmm. amazing yes it was yeah and i yes, i know was. for you to see the smile number one on that number one woman's That's face right. is like the epitome of reaching yes. self-actualization exactly yeah it yeah. was yeah. all right so um yes. mm-hmm. so you get this job yeah, and this are job. you still working with this agency or I, have you moved I work, on i well okay um remember that i'm coming out of incarceration and this even goes for people who graduate from college mm-hmm. uh usually it's very difficult to find jobs that you uh that you majored in in college because of the simple fact that you don't have experience in what it is that you majored in so that's right. why they created those internships where you can actually work in the places side by side by people for you can actually gain some experience mm-hmm. um i started out as a uh a, 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 um, a pd per diem so i really was just monitoring um homeless people even though i was sitting on a bachelor's degree okay uh but so it's sort of like security it's like security okay You're just monitoring All right. and um but i knew that if i get my foot inside that door mm-hmm. that i would be able i know that I'm going to be able to move up because I, I always had I I've always had this confidence in myself. Mm-hmm. So it took a little while. I became a, a PD to an RA. Um, you know, I went from 700 and change to 800 every two weeks. You know, money kept going up higher and higher. Residential mm-hmm. assistant. Yeah, residential RA. assistant RA. I became mm-hmm. an RA. Then you know, after I became an RA, a case manager had left the job and. One of the RAs had already recognized that I had a bachelor's degree, so he ran up there and he spoke to uh, the director wow. and said, listen, you know, the guy downstairs got a bachelor's degree. They said, who? Who, who got a bachelor's degree? And they said, um, uh, Javier. Javier? 
He said, what? Send him up here. And I went up there, and uh, he said, you got a bachelor's degree? I said, yes, I do. I got a bachelor's degree, an organizational manager. And he said, when can you start? <laughs> and I said, uh, what do you mean? What do you want me to do? He said, I want you to be a case manager. So he gave me the case manager's position. And wow. I, I, was, I stayed as a case manager for a while, about a couple of years. And then uh, another opportunity came along, you know, making more money. So and I, when I jumped on that opportunity, because now I have the experience. See, yes. I didn't have it before, but mm -hmm. I have it now. Mm -hmm. And that bilingual stuff take you a long way. It surely does. You know, so. it surely does. Well, <laughs> Javier, pause. We have another go ahead, caller. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Hi, caller. Who am I speaking with? This is Jamela. Oh Hi, my God. Jamela. <laughs> Where are you calling from, Jamela? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm from Queens. I'm his cousin. Oh, yeah. we got the whole family calling. Hey, Jamila, yeah. let me just warn you, okay? <laughs> Mom already made me shed some tears now. Don't we? Don't got. Well, I needed to. I had. That's <laughs> why I had to call mommy and give her the number because I need. I'm watching the show, yes. and I had to see a tear come from him because <laughs> I know she would be the only one Absolutely. to make him tear up. Mm -hmm. I just called to say, Javier, you are so my inspiration in life mm. is unbelievable wow. where, where you've been where you are and where you are going I'm so proud of you mm. I love you so much and keep up the good work thank you baby good stuff Jamila thank you for calling in we appreciate you thank you alright mm. alright mm -hmm. interesting wow. look at that Look at Ooh, that Lord total I'm... transformation. Hey, hey, total. Oh. Let me tell you, I was having, mm -hmm. you know, my tradition yes. uh, when when I leave uh, my my um, nine to five is to go to IHOP, sit down, have a nice little meal before I, because I was so, um, yeah, I'm yeah. an adjunct at LIU. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the, you know, like a pre recording. I usually try to introduce who's yes. coming onto the show. And I had such a great feeling about tonight mm. you know uh, um, about this conversation yes. because not not too often are we able to have a real conversation mm. um that's so impactful not mm. to say that our conversations haven't been real because they're all real mm. but when we come from a space of someone who has had um a, a long stretch yes. of incarceration and mm. and has made that and, and can sit and just be a hundred percent accountable responsible not minimize not blame not make any excuses mm. i think that's exemplary exactly you know you don't you you just don't see that as often as you would want to got you you know so mm -hmm. you have my full attention i'm sure you have everybody out there's full attention their admiration mm -hmm. for for you just just being accountable for your actions and saying I was wrong. Mm. You know, I admit to my wrongdoings. I did wrong and this is what I'm going to do now. Not to, cause you can't change that. No, you can't. But moving forward, exactly. just to show my, my appreciation yes. for, you know, the support that I've received, um, keeping your head on your shoulders and just saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give back and by any means necessary yes. you know and having that strong foundation with the higher power is is amazing gotcha. you know a lot of people don't understand the strength of the higher power and mm -hmm. once you give yourself over to the higher power how many doors can open no matter how many exactly. foot or you know hurdles you have to jump over exactly. when that door is open from you for yes. you through the higher power nobody i mean nobody can close it Exactly. You know, and I heard a lot of that yes. from from you um, tonight. And I just want to personally before, you know, we get off the air, because I know sometimes I forget to I, I don't have enough time to just say thank you. Yes. You know, thank you for sharing your intimate story, your experiences. And thank you just for being real. Gotcha. You know, uh, not a lot of people could sit at the table and be real about their experience and real about, you know, just their truth. Exactly. You know, and you left your you covered your six, but you also left yourself wide open and you're humble with the experience. Mm -hmm. And in and in doing so, you have so many different support systems that are that are willing to be there for you continuously yes. and also call in to give that insight. Gotcha. So I, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, th what else could I say at this point? Yes. <laughs> Cool. But I mean, That's the good. ultimate question is, mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing for the community? For the community? No, well, well, let me change that. What are you continuing to do to do for, for our community? Uh, I think that the field that I have chosen mm -hmm. as a career mm -hmm. is uh, basically assisting people on an everyday basis. And um, although I may not share what I've shared with you with my uh, with the participants of my class. Right. Uh, 
me being able to connect with them because we all come from the same place because we speak the same language is what has made me so successful and being able to motivate people to want to do something for themselves mm -hmm. you know because for a long time you know i was I, when i was working with the the homeless shelter you know i noticed that i was getting a lot of clients that just really wanted to live in the shelter mm. they really didn't want to find or even get any help on living on their own right so uh i learned a a, a tool in being uh and working as a case manager for a homeless shelter because now the reason why i'm so effective is because i want to know who you are now and what you're looking for and what direction are you trying to go? Or do you like your situation? Mm. Because once I get those type of answers out of you, then that's going to assist me to motivate you. Right. You understand? And how many times have people have come back and thanked me because, yo, man, you know, what you told me really changed my life. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that I, you know, said anything, you know, incredible. It's that I got to know you. And once I got to, got to know you, then I started to learn what to say to you. Right. In order to get you to want to move out, get out these chairs. That's right. You Not know, be complacent. Anymore. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. no one, no body should be complacent living off of public assistance. You know, and New York is not a very easy place to live. That's number one. The Tell rent. Me about it. I mean, the rent for a studio by itself, they want fourteen, fifteen hundred. I depend on where you live. Right. So, uh, some places more. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, is that you know, if you really think that the the homeless shelter is going to get you a place to to stay no then you're wrong because mm -hmm. believe it or not they don't even have places for you guys to go and what cuomo actually did was just uh fund more money to open up more shelters so he solved the situation of getting you off the street but he didn't solve the situation of finding you a Permanent place in, yeah a vacancy mm -hmm. so don't think that th it's not like it used to be where i could go mm -hmm. to a homeless sh shelter and all of a sudden a year later you got an apartment no that's you're absolutely wrong about right, that right you know this is a place here that um you ever heard that record back in the days i tell my participants this a lot you know remember street life street life mm -hmm. oh yeah that's right that's a, well, you better not get old or you're gonna feel a cold well that fits yeah that fits more of this era than it fit back in that era mm -hmm. because in this era you better figure out a way of making some money for you can find a place to stay. Yeah. Because this is not an easy place to live. If you can live in New York, you can live anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. I agree with that. Anywhere. So, you know, I promote entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't even know that they got skills that, you know, that that can be utilized for you to make some extra money while you work in a steady job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard guys in the class tell me, nah, man, I don't know how to do nothing else. What do you mean you know how to do anything else? What did you do? What type of job did you do? Mm -hmm. Well, I worked in maintenance. So that means you know how to buff floors, don't you, brother? I said, do you know you get a van and buy a buffer and open up your own business and give your own cards? You He's, got that motivational interviewing skill going on, huh? No, 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 yeah, no. Yeah, but, he, you know, he, yeah. You know, but yeah. it's, it's this is what I do. I do this every day. Yes. You know, this is how, this is what I do. I do this is my this is my job. That this empowerment is, is real every day. Okay. But you know, and because of that, this is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But um, Where by do you see your future. My future. Yes. What does your future look like? You know what my okay. I, this is what I do. I look. I go around. I go around the class, right? And mm -hmm. I ask every one of them. I say, how much money do you think? you should be you could you should make to live comfortable in new york oh. and you got one guy he tells you oh, 200,000 the other one says 300 the other guy says oh, a million one guy says nah i'm good with 11 bucks an hour you know mm -hmm. so we go down the line so what i see in the future you know what makes me feel comfortable i need a million baby <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but I need. But when I'm talking about that, this is something that I'm going to constantly increase mm -hmm. as my career. Like you know, I need to go back and complete my master's degree. I need to put myself in a better situation. I need to be, have the credentials now that I have the experience to be able to just put myself in a better place in life. Mm -hmm. And before I'm 60 years old, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. I've made it this far. I just finally got my a permit to get my driver's license back yes. you know what I'm saying so I could finally drive again thank God yeah you know I think for a long time they told me I couldn't drive <laughs> yes, and they said I couldn't drive because I don't know for whatever reason it was maybe because there was a high speed chase in New Jersey but anyway <laughs> oh help us Tommy is starting to get in trouble again he's eating turn around <laughs> yes, and they, but for whatever reason it was they didn't want me to drive so uh, no guess what nobody can stop me from driving now mm -hmm. 
I got my license back, so you know, going to work on a car. Then I'm from there. We're going to work on a couple other things. But I do. My my goal, ultimate goal, is never stop and be complacent. Yes. I need more money. And that's it. And we're yeah. going to figure out a way of doing it. I'm also going to open up my little business on the side because, you know, I do a lot of plumbing work. Okay. So I'm going to open my business back up. And I'm going to get my cards out. And I'm going to I'm gonna you know, get my customers to come, you know, back on board. And uh, we're going to, uh, believe me, this man going to survive. And as long as I got my health, I'm good. Well, we believe that. You are a survivor. <laughs> going to survive. You right. are a survivor. That's right. The that's true right. essence of building safer that's communities. Right. What that's is right. it? Here we have it right here. Adapt, right. survive, rebuild, and thrive. Exactly. Hello. There you go. Hello. That's so what right. would you say to... Mm -hmm. Um, I know you addressed this um, briefly um, when I think Michael called in. But what would you say mm -hmm. to the community out there? Not only young boys, mm -hmm. young girls too. Because society, you know, the way some of these children act in the street and, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of, you know. It, it, sometimes parents don't have a hold on their children mm -hmm. they, the way that they should because mm -hmm. the government is more involved. They're mm -hmm. limited and it, there's, there's a fine line between discipline and corporal punishment if you understand where I'm going with this. I what would you say to the youth out there? Okay. Or even someone who is 32, okay. you know, and, mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're surrounding themselves around someone or people who are not productive hmm. and adding value to their life. Okay. And, you know, what would All you right. say? All right. I'm going to answer because to me, I got two, I got two questions out of it. One is like, uh, uh, I, I have to say that um, women in, incarcerate, the, the women prisons are, are starting to uh, build up. They're starting to fill up more, a lot more now Didn't than they before. were when you know we were younger. Mm -hmm. uh, for the young women, okay, listen, I know I'm gonna sound like an OG and an old guy from you know back back in the days, but the reality is that nobody's gonna respect you unless you start respecting yourself. And when I say that, that means that you carry yourself in a certain way that you want to have that respect for yourself. And I think that the reason why I'm saying that is because I'm, I'm observing and I'm, I'm very analytical and I'm watching the youth, uh, especially the young women of these days, that are doing things out there that are, are attracting and losing respect. Mm. So it's about respecting yourself first and then you don't have to worry about other people disrespecting you. That's number one. So number two for the youth out there, listen, you got to find your direction in life that's going to make you the most productive person. You have to do it. I can't do it for you. You're, we can advise you. But you have to find the direction that you're looking for in life that's going to make you the most productive in life. Mm -hmm. Legally, okay? Let me just emphasize this legal stuff because this thing seems to me like people want to make quick money. Mm -hmm. You know, and quick money don't do nothing but bring you to a quick prison. Mm -hmm. All right? And uh, that's too many of us in there. And if, uh, if you don't know that, then go to the maximum state prisons and go visit. You're going to see that there are more Hispanics and blacks in those, in those walls than you will see any other people, period. So you go to the mediums and you'll see the other ones, you know, people that you've never seen before. But when I'm talking about maximum state prison, maximum state prison is filled with us. You know, when I say they fill with us, it's because all of us are trying to find the quickest way to make the most money mm -hmm. you know, instead of working hard for it. You got to find a direction in life and to put you in the best position in life to make you the most productive person. And don't stop there. Continue. I did it. So definitely you can do it. All right. That's right. Okay. Hmm? Got me stuck. I'm like, oh. Got you. You never told her what you told me. Oh. Oh, okay. okay. I have to say this. Okay, this is um this was in the beginning of my journey when I first got incarcerated. I've never been incarcerated before. I was walking back and forth inside the bullpen and um I was in the Brooklyn House of Detention in nineteen ninety eight and there was an old man like watching me, wa watching me walk back and forth. He kept watching me and then he said, Listen, come over here, sit down for a second. And I said, Yes, old man, what's going on? He said, Oh, first thing, don't call me old. And second is mm -hmm. uh I have to tell you something. He says, uh I want you to tell me what this means in 10 years. He said, welcome to the cemetery of the living. And when he said that to me, I said, wait a minute. What do you mean by that? He says, after 10 years, you tell me what the meaning of it means. Wow. You know, and guess what? Now I know the meaning of it. The meaning of the cemetery of the living is that in the beginning, everybody loves you. You receive letters from friends, cousins. Oh, letters are coming all over the place. 
Then it came a time inside the prison that you looking you looking outside the gate to see if the if the if the correction officer even stops at your gate if to, to even drop a piece of paper because you don't receive no more letters anymore because people continue with your with their lives. Mm. The only one that's incarcerated is you. Mm. So the cemetery of the living meaning that you have become forgotten, and it's only a couple of people that really stand behind you. Your mother's usually one. And your kids, if you have some, you know. But everyone else, they go do what they're going to do, man. And if you do have somebody else out there that holds you down, appreciate that person when you get out. Because it's not easy to have someone to hold you down for six, more than a decade. Mm. It's very difficult. And there were times, yes, that I used to stare out <laughs> stare out that gate with the mirror. Every, everybody who's in Cosby know about that mirror. That mirror to see if the correction officer is even heading down the gallery to see if they're even going to drop any letter to your, to your cell. Any. I'm talking about anything. I don't care who it came from. It could have been junk mail. I would have still took it and read the junk mail. I ain't even get that. So, you know, you know, but it was always one person that I know always know that that letter I was going to receive. Mm-hmm. And that's that, that little woman that called up my mother, mm-hmm. and she never failed me. So I may not receive letters from anybody else. But I definitely received a letter from her. <laughs> was that some shade? Yeah. No. <laughs> I definitely received a letter. To the from red her. again, Javier. That's yes, right. Trouble. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that was in there. But that's what that's what it meant. That's what it meant. And and then you look at the people around you, and you'll notice that there are families that never come see. Wow. Never come see their loved one. You got some mothers like they say, "Listen, man, I, I told you not to go back in there. If you go back in there, you know, I ain't coming to see you no more." They got mothers that do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and uh, here they are. They trying to get all the little hustle. Because there's a lot of hustling in prison. So they got their little hustle together, whatever they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. Some of them sell oil. Some of them sell this. Some of them cook food. Some of them sell food, you know. There's a lot of little hustles that they have that they make their little extra money. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the way they live because there is no other help. Meaning there is no family on the outside that they can say, you know, can you send me this bag? I need a pair of sneakers. I need this. I need that. There is nobody. Right. Everybody, however you uh, acted or whatever type of person you were before you were incarcerated, you killed all those ties. Mm-hmm. Now Some people sever ties, yeah, right? They burn their right, bridges. And then other people just like kind of dwindle yeah. away because life exactly. continues, like you were saying the old exactly. man reminded yeah. you of. That's right. Yeah. And you know, I had a dream because, and it's funny because one of the dreams that I had or a little bit before I came home is that I had a dream with, 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 uh, with Danielle and I had a dream with uh, Lurie and I had a dream with Yvette Singletary and Yvonne and the dream was yeah the dream was I was walking on 158th street and they all looked at me and they said wow where you been all this time oh my god and then I went and told my story where I've been mm. you know but you know what that what that gave me and it, it, it gave me a, a sort of wisdom you know what the wisdom is that I'm actually living two lives in one Mm. I'm actually living two lives in one Because now I go back to the neighborhood The neighborhood ain't the same Definitely the same people ain't there <laughs> You know what I'm saying So and here I am starting all over Okay And uh, brand new Educated Full of awesomeness <laughs> Yeah that's right So I'll tell you this has been mm-hmm. um, a moving moment thank you you know we shared um <laughs> a lot of information it was very insightful again mm-hmm. i'm i'm very grateful and honored to have you sitting before me today gotcha. um, i'm extremely proud of you <laughs> gotcha. um and i'm mm-hmm. looking you know I, i'm hoping that this won't be the last time we all get together and maybe gotcha. we can you know formulate something where everyone gets together and we just share okay. moments i'm really interested in that mm-hmm. um but again thank you so much for coming on and sharing um this yes. piece of your life gotcha. um and i'm hoping that moving forward everything works out exactly the way that you want to with some added positivity to it mm-hmm. um in addition to what you know whatever you want mm-hmm. um and i just want to say thank you so much to the viewers and supporters thank you so much to the call-ins of course thank you to my number one supporter todd taylor who's always in the house thank you to the mm-hmm. um engineer for tonight uh mom you are the greatest mm-hmm. yes you are definitely the greatest um and thank you so much for those out there who did support javier while he was gone um of course he was not forgotten thank you 
So you've been tuned into Questions, Answers, and Solutions. Thank you so much. If you want to see the full show, you can go to buildingsafercommunities.com backslash radio. It's been wonderful. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Good night. Mm, beautiful.